welcome back to advertising is dead we're talking to alex alex welcome to the show oh. thank you it's a pleasure to be here yep i mean i was running through my notes of of what all we should kind of talk about today one of the things that kind of stood out for me is that um the creator economy largely seems to be in the education space uh, that seems to be the most like it's growing in focus so um i'd actually want to kind of start off with saying um where do you think the opportunities lie across the creator economy and then maybe we can kind of like go a little further into the education space so a, a bit of a broad landscape to start off with but i just want to kind of uh, kick off with that absolutely um so maybe to talk about where the creator economy is going i think it's important to look back and see where it's come from if you know 3 4 5 years ago if you were an aspiring content creator you wanted to make videos online you could make videos on multiple platforms but you couldn't necessarily make money on multiple platforms the main place to go and make money was was youtube um and i think that uh beyond that what we saw was platforms outside of that platforms like facebook uh now platforms like instagram tiktok and others who have enabled creators to monetize their videos in different ways and as that monetization has evolved you know creators have looked at you know how they can leverage their audiences their distribution network to do different things because ultimately and there's you know been a couple of creators who've talked about this on different channels the evolution from being a you know making videos to being a big channel is i'm now almost like a media network yeah and i can do multiple things with that media network So beyond that then the question is well what do i do with that audience and this is actually a process that nas academy had thought about when it first started which was that okay if i have this distribution network but the way that i can make money and build a business is a little bit limited hmm. because if i make money through ads um one month can be really good and i can earn i have a great month hmm. and one month cannot be so good how, and the challenge is you know how do i build a team so when we looked at it we said Okay in the creator economy I can sell products with my audience so I can say hey buy a t-shirt hey buy an iPhone case yeah. but actually when it comes down to it the majority of people who make content on the internet are not actually going around and talking about buying physical products you know in the case of our founder at Nas Academy Nas Daily mm. he was also about you know, living a minimalist life yeah. traveling the world so if he suddenly turns around and sells you an iPhone case it is a it is not a direct relationship with his content mm. so to answer your question about education why i think we're seeing more creators go into education is because education is actually one of the most on brand things a creator can do mm. when they look at it you know they have accumulated large amounts of knowledge through their journey through trial and error through hundreds of hours thousands of hours of content and so when that audience sort of consumes that content they can be saying okay wow i love the information that you're sharing with me which actually is an educational experience or i am super impressed on how you make your content and i'd love to learn how you do that so i can do it myself yeah so nas academy actually was was started because we felt that education was the most relevant thing for us to do and i think mm-hmm. that that trend is going to many many different types of creators who see that same opportunity um but beyond that you know more widely in terms of the creator economy we are seeing a lot of exciting innovations you're seeing things in um in food you know we see uh we see content creators establishing their own virtual restaurants yeah, um yeah. we're seeing content creators building um you know fintech brands you know starting credit cards we're seeing people starting consumer brands so i don't think education is the only thing yeah. but i think it's exciting because it actually is relevant to many different types of creators i think the whole aspect of all creators are actually entrepreneurs i think kind of stands here right i'm i'm just taking away from what you just said is the fact that um you can't just make money off of brand deals in the long term because at some point and i feel creator burnout has also has become a thing people are talking about how much they have to create how consistently they have to create and um while you were talking i also think about i remember having this chat with a 16 year old um and he was talking about how he wants to be a youtuber and i said where do you learn stuff from he said i love my primary source of learning is youtube and and the content i watch online um so in many ways people are already learning from um creators but how do you take how creators are already kind of maybe putting content out that people can learn from and how do you kind of build that into a platform and kind of give it a few more layers there right so how how do you guys kind of look at that aspect how do you add those layers in 
Absolutely. So I think it is true that if you talk to those who have been able to develop their skills online, whether it be creating video content, whether it be you know, building a business online, yeah. many uh, people have been successful through learning on YouTube. Yeah. However, I think that what I, what I personally learned from my own educational journey as a student yeah. is that people learn in different ways. So there are some people who are very good at learning things by themselves. Mm. But actually, I can talk on my personal experience as a learner. I always learn best with others. I always mm. learn best when I had something that I could do rather than just like watching a, a mm. teacher talk or theory. Mm. And so I think that YouTube caters for a specific learner who is very, very motivated, who is very, very disciplined, who can take watching something that someone else does and then doing it. But I think that that may be a small percentage of the total population who wants to learn. And my, our question was, well, what happens to everyone else? And I think this holds true for the traditional education system. Mm. You know, 60% of the world find education boring. However, whilst many people find education boring or they dislike education, they love to learn. And mm. there's this fundamental distinction between those two. So what we see as the sort of next step beyond YouTube is, okay, how can I take what's great about learning something from an expert, but give them support, give them assistance, and give them community so that they can learn in lots of different ways? And that's where I think education platforms can help. Mm. Because otherwise, as the user, why would I pay for a course when I could just go on YouTube and learn this for free? And, and that's mm. a question that we ask ourselves every day. We said, we are not competing with another course on another platform. Mm. When a creator comes on as Academy, they are competing with free. And I'm sure that, you know, listeners here, when they're thinking about education, they are thinking about that same, you know, mm. why as a consumer would you pay for something unless it can give you additional value? And, and I think that's where education platforms more widely need to, need to build on. Uh, so that actually takes me to two different sides of things. Right? One is that you look at how education itself has kind of changed. I think from a perception standpoint, um, I guess none of us really had a option to, there was the traditional way of learning and, and education. You go to school, you go to college and or university and you kind of get a job. Um, and that's been totally disrupted with the fact that people can learn online. Um, and on top of that, the layer, which, which you just spoke about, which I think is very interesting saying that, um, it's an enhancement of what you're able to consume. It's not, it's not one-sided. It's actually, you, you know, you, you've got a lot happening there as well. Um, so if you kind of had to run through the process of how you um, look at this as a company saying, so how do you kind of look at it from like to point one to, to almost delivery to the, the consumer and or, or the person getting educated and, and, and kind of making sure that loop is going on. Um, how do you look at someone who's looking to learn today? Um, and, and, and how does your process kind of feed into that? Absolutely. So I think it's important to share with, with those listening that the reason why education is changing online is largely due to the pandemic. Before the pandemic, if you tried to convince someone to learn on Zoom, for example, yeah. Yeah. it would be a lot harder than it is today because you know consumers were not used to doing that. So the way that education was widely adopted, whether it be in, you know, in Southeast Asia, in India, in the US, was largely through recorded videos. You know, the idea that you could watch someone who is an expert anytime, anyplace. But what happened was in the pandemic, we got used to live interactions, live virtual interactions, and that opened up a possibility for all different types of education. And so we were actually started in the pandemic. We were started in, in sort of February 2020. Mm -hmm. So we actually were lucky to see these changes and say, OK, based on how people are now more used to learning online, how do we build this experience end to end? So actually, our first try in this space was to do 100% live classes to say, mm. you know, Alex, I want to learn from this famous YouTuber. Let's put you in a live class to learn directly from them. Mm. And, you know, the first few times that was great, but we immediately encountered some issues. You know, the first issue is that if you get a famous YouTuber from the US, maybe the time they're available is in the middle of the night for someone in Singapore yeah. or in India. How do you deal with time zone? The second part is that if you are a content creator who has a lot of commitments, which increasingly some of the best people to learn from have a lot of uh, different commitments, it's hard to get them to allocate the time to teach live regularly. 
So what we thought and what we learned in our journey was to say, okay, how do we bring the best knowledge from the individual to access the most people, but also bring the best of how people learn together? How do people make friends online? How do people build a community? And how people can actually learn by doing. So that was sort of where we started. And what we learned and what we built was a process where we, we said, we think that with pre-recorded classes, you can actually get a lot of good insights. But for those who want to learn by doing, we think the best way is to build a process where you learn over several days. Mm. And each day you do something um, along that journey. And then within that, once you like actually do an assignment, do homework, wherever you want to call it, it would be great to get someone who can actually feedback on whether you're doing a good job or not. Yeah. And so that's how we layered it. So video, um, exercises doing, but then direct personal interactions to get feedback. And then if you're going through a journey of learning something new, like becoming a content creator, well, it's so much more powerful if I'm starting that journey with someone else who I can get feedback, you know, who's going through it and we can learn together. So that's how we built the learning experience. I think in the, the wider ecosystem, there is a, a buzzword that a lot of people might have heard, which is cohort-based courses. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, to explain what that means, cohort-based courses is the idea that you learn together uh, as a cohort, as a class. So it's almost taking what's the best of what offline education yeah. provides yeah. and trying to bring, build it online. Um, I think there are lots of different ways you can do that. And there's some great companies out there who are trying different methods. I think our learning is that the best cohort experience is a mixture of learning by yourself mm. and learning together. And that's sort of what we built. Um, I think that also kind of changes things for, for the creators who are trying to teach themselves. Right. I, I, I love the point you made is that, and that's always was my question about live classes. I'm like, um, also, if a person has to keep repeating the same thing, uh, knowing how creators' minds work, um, I'm, I'm guessing the energy levels just go down further or they'll try to change things up all the time, right? So I'm, I think that, that would have been one, one, one point of, of, of issue as well. But uh, how do you work with, with, with the creators who kind of come onto the platform? Because obviously, you don't let everybody kind of come in and build a course on the platform, but you actually work with um, a wide set of people. You, 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 know, you have a certain fil filter system. So how does that part work? How do you kind of work with them to be able to do this better and, and stuff like that without giving away any secret sauce rather? No, absolutely. I'm happy to share uh, with the audience here because I think it's actually really important for any creator economy startup or company. So the first thing to say, and we learned this very early on, um, is that just because a content creator has a lot of followers, hmm. it does not mean that their followers are super engaged or that they want to buy something that the content creator creates. And so the reason why we actually filter who can teach on NAS Academy is because we want to focus right now on who, which creators we think can be the best educators. So I'll give you some examples of some of the things we do to filter. So the first thing we look at is, does the creator create video content that is educational by nature? And what I mean by that is, if I'm a travel creator, I can travel the world and I'll be telling you about the places I go. That is educational. You know, I'm learning about a new place. I'm learning about a new culture in a way that person is teaching you about something versus um, a person, a creator who maybe is a comedian. If I'm a comedian, I may love this person's content. I may consume it. I may watch it all the time. It doesn't mean I want to be a comedian. It doesn't mean that I learn something from them. So what we have decided in our journey is that we want to start with those who actually um, educate. The second thing that we look at is teachability. So someone can make really great content on YouTube, but does it mean that they are engaging as an individual? Does it mean that if I watched a three hour, four hour class that I would actually sort of resonate with them, engage with them, find it interesting? And so we screen based on certain metrics, um, what is the teachability score of this creator? And then I think the final part is, do people actually want to learn what they can teach? Um, you know, they could teach a great course on something, but it doesn't mean there is demand to actually learn that. And so we also do research about what are the, what are consumer trends? What do people actually want to learn right now? What do their audience want to learn? You know, they say, I follow this person because I love their travel videos. 
And actually what I want to learn is how to travel on a budget or how to um, pack lightly, or, you know, there may be four or five different things. And so we screen to try and really like uh, nail that in. So that's why right now we are very selective. Um, so we work with about a hundred different creators right now from across the world. Um, over the next few years, our mission is to make almost every creator an educator. Yeah. But what we, what we think is that different creators may educate in different ways. So someone may want to teach a short course about a specific topic they, they learn. Another person may want to teach more like, and you talked about this, um, more like a full-on degree, yeah. which is I want to teach you everything you want to know about this subject. And so yeah. we, through this journey and as the creative economy develops, we want to cater for all those different types of users. Yeah, I'm, and actually speaking of degrees, one of the most interesting updates I saw on the platform was the fact that you're not just doing individual courses, you can bundle them up as a degree, which is almost like one of those things when you look at it, like, this makes total sense. Why has no one done it yet? Um, then you look at it uh, because it makes total sense. Um, so uh, I'd love to kind of like ask you to talk about that a little bit. How you looked at the bundling aspect and or rather, have you seen that this is something consumers are actually doing? They're buying multiple courses and you kind of say, okay, this, this is something we should do. Yeah, absolutely. So when we started our journey, we were, we were very interested in the concept of can education from experts online replace um, a university degree? Mm -hmm. And our first step was actually to say, okay, can we partner with an institution who has accreditation mm -hmm. and we can get an accredited degree and that will be great for people to be able to learn. But what we found actually was, was two, twofold. Number one, was in order to get accreditation, you had to conform to the way old education is like, yeah. which is not how people we believe want to learn. The second point we found was actually as employers, when we actually asked employers, they weren't interested in the accreditation. They were more interested in what the person has actually done with that education. Hmm. You know, what have they managed to achieve? How resourceful are they? Uh, how entrepreneurial are they? You know, all the core skills that I think maybe your listeners are considering as they think about, you know, specific jobs and career changes. So our bet was that, okay, if accreditation doesn't really matter, then what we need to focus on is how do we build programs that people can learn, but people can do. And if they can build that portfolio of doing, then that will be the gateway that a traditional degree is to a job in the same way, in, but just yeah. in, a, in, a, in a new format. So we bundled courses together and we call them degrees, a little bit controversial, but um, essentially what we do is we say, if you want to be a content creator, what are the skills you need to know? And let's put the courses together. So you know that if I wanna get started and I wanna grow, I just buy this one degree, I learn it end to end. And then beyond that, with each of those, how do we get people to do projects mm. through the course in order to graduate? And then with that portfolio, can we even give them opportunities to earn money? So can we link them with, for example, job opportunities to create content? And we've seen that through our courses, and this is actually one of the things that has been really so exciting to see, is the content creators who are teachers have actually linked some of their students with, with uh, collaboration opportunities. Oh, nice. So, so we have a course with Dan Mace, who's a, a YouTube filmmaker, yeah. and he had a big project with a, with a massive brand. Um, and he was like, I want to collaborate with my students. And he got about 50 students, and he got them involved in the project. So going back to that degree point, not only am I coming out with the knowledge, but then I go to my neck, my job and I say, I've done a collaboration with this big brand. Mm -hmm. Here is, you know, here, here, take a look at it as well. So we see that, um, you know, we call it degrees. You know, we think mm -hmm. that there are so many different combinations. I think that in, in more widely as a wider trend, this ability to be able to take knowledge from the internet plus doing, plus, yeah. you know, finding ways to monetize will be ways that people can actually use that to get jobs. Um, in terms of the traction, it's been very interesting that the feedback we've had from consumers is they like that the options are presented for them yeah. so that they actually can know these are the things I can learn in one package. So the, the, the traction and you know, people buying has been really encouraging. Um, but I think our goal is to give people more and more degree options. So at the moment we have a handful, but we, we would like to see many more. You know, um, while you're talking, I also thought what, what's interesting is that, you know, one way to have people do more courses is, is, is something like degrees, but also um, as with any platform, you also want people to come back for more. Right? You want them to come back and learn newer things and and almost be a part of their evolution and some way, you know, have, have that connection always. Uh, one way is this. The other way is 
um is about and and you were speaking about this right before we hit record and i'd love for you to talk about it is how coming as a student and eventually become an educator um and you and, and, and love for you to talk about it before me giving anything away absolutely no so we one of the most interesting things that i've seen in the last year is we've had a situation where a student has come in um, and learned the skills of becoming a content creator mm. has taken those skills and has grown on the internet to several hundred thousand followers and has become an expert in what they do and has had a huge base and then we had the uh, we were looking for a course on a specific subject and we realized that the best person to teach it was actually <laughs> our student so we invited them back on the platform as a teacher and they were able to actually teach and that full cycle um was number one it was so inspiring for us the team to see that from a student Yeah. but also i think opens up the possibilities of the creator economy ecosystem which is that you know i think underlying all these other opportunities to build things with individuals in the creator economy there has to be a solid educational infrastructure to allow people to learn these things yeah. so what has been interesting is that i have been con continuously impressed by the you know the desire for creators to give back through education um even those who are extremely busy uh they 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 consistently say i i benefited from a teacher in my life or i wish i had these resources when i was starting up and i would love to find a way to teach others and you know with those who are even with millions of followers they engage and look at what their students produce and for them it's incredibly satisfying so i hope to see that this trend of student to teacher student to creator to teacher happening more and more and i think that should happen if the creator economy continues to grow at as as it has grown in the last few years you know um I have a ton more questions to ask right i a want to also get into your journey i want to get into how this works from a business side and a bunch of other things but i know we need to go in for a break so i'm going to do that and be right back with advertising is dead welcome back to advertising is dead still talking to alex um uh, alex i want to like go to one as which i really wanted to talk about is that um, your journey was not of a content creator if i'm if i'm right um That's right. were you a content creator ever did you ever consider yourself a content creator or did you try stuff out um, at any point of time i was not um <laughs> i was not a content creator i did not have or do not have aspirations to be a content creator <laughs> um So yeah, I, I actually got into this space a little bit by accident. I, you know, happy to talk a little bit more about. That. Yeah, I, and I'd love to hear that because I feel that oftentimes when people talk about what the opportunity in the creator economy is, you always assume the opportunity is for creators only. But there's so much more that you can do as professionals, as as as, you know, as entrepreneurs, and everything else. So um, I I I'd love if you can talk about how you um you know from your journey at at Uber and Grab kind of ended up in this space and 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 how that has been. Yeah, so I am as an individual someone who is driven by specific problems that I see. And as you mentioned uh Baron that my journey before the creator economy was working in um the gig economy, mm -hmm. ride sharing, food delivery. So I started my journey in that space about 5 years ago uh when I joined Uber in Southeast Asia and For me the reason why I got into that space was in a similar way I became obsessed with the problem about how people move in cities mm. um I live in Singapore and Singapore as well is it's got good infrastructure you know has yeah. a good public transport system but as I worked across Southeast Asia I just saw this big problem which was you know that there when you don't have fun, uh, fundamental infrastructure it just affects everything you do um True. how you can get to a job uh how you can earn an income you know many many different aspects how you move packages around how you can get food um so i was you know that obsession brought me into the the gig economy but interestingly um my time you know i spent 4 years both at uber and then at grab um which is southeast asia's uh, biggest you know super app ride sharing food delivery and i think what was interesting at that time i was working in countries like vietnam and indonesia and i saw this trend in food delivery which was super interesting to me which was that the restaurants with the highest ratings weren't necessary the restaurants that got the most orders or generated the most revenue. Mm. And so I deep dived into this problem a little bit more. So why was that? What was happening? And what I realized was that often the ones the restaurants who were performing the best were those who were good at content. They were using social media platforms to build awareness, to market themselves, to build excitement. Um and some of the early food delivery apps actually did a lot of experimentation about how 
you can get restaurants to be able to use their content to attract new customers. And so I had this sort of moment where I, I sort of realized that, wow, if this is happening in Indonesia, in small restaurants, in you know, small cities, this is gonna happen everywhere in every industry because every industry has the same problem. So that was sort of what part of my interest about the role that content can play. And what I realized was that there wasn't an underlying education system. Yeah. At the same time, my wife, like many people during the pandemic, uh, her company was an offline events company. Mm. And so they stopped, um, they stopped doing any work. So she had no work. Um, and at the same time, she saw a class, how to make content online, which happened to be in Nas Academy's first class. Oh. And so she took a class, which cost her about $400. And within two months, she had made $30,000 for her company in mm. revenue, just through the skills she learned which was making videos, it was in the art space. And so that was a, sort of another moment for me, which was if someone has just taken a class and been able to learn these skills, and there's been so much interest for someone who's a beginner, essentially beginner intermediate, mm. then there is the demand um, and there's the need. And so at that point, I got just very, very excited about the creator economy. Um, how I ended up in a creator economy company, and this goes back to your question around yeah. um, skills, was sort of by chance. So through that class, I met the team at Nas Academy and I understood, and this is a really common problem for creators, mm. is that creators often understand what needs to be done on the content side, but they need help on the business side, on the product mm. side. They need to understand how to build a platform. They need to understand how to, you know, how to build a team. They need to understand how to manage you know, operations, accounting, you know, legal, fundraising. Yeah. And those people need to be the experts who know this. And they come from all different industries. So when people are thinking about the creator economy, don't just think about the actual content creation side. Yeah. Think about the fact that these are businesses that need to grow. And they need all the skills that other technology and traditional businesses need. So in fact, I see you know, constantly on Twitter, um, big content creators say, I'm looking for head of operations. Mm. I'm looking for a CEO. Um, I think there's a big shortage of yeah. talent in other sectors coming into the creator economy. So I don't think that those listening need to be a content creator or an expert. Mm. But what I would say is you need to be interested in the space. Yeah. You know, one of the questions that we ask, if anyone's ever applying to NAS Academy, but one of the questions we always ask is, who is your favorite YouTuber? Who is your favorite TikToker? And we want to understand, you know, it's not a trick question, is we want to understand, is someone interested in the space? Yeah. Yeah. Is someone actually, because there is a lot of nuances. And just to give you a quick example, you know, there's a nuance between building for a business and building for a creator. A creator is a, a brand. They're very, very sensitive about their brand. So if you ask them to do things which hand over their brand, for them in their mind, it could be, you know, if, if you mishandle my brand and my name, I lose all my business, yeah. you know, which is very different than working with an individual who works in a company. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, um, Baron, for, for your podcast, it's the same thing, right? You yeah, as a creator, exactly. you know, I'm, you know, and it's, it's, it's something that I think people come from the traditional corporate world. They need to get into that mindset of how, how an individual creator thinks. Yeah. And, and, and I feel that also comes to the fact that ever since the term economy got tagged onto the creator space, no, I think it's also changed on fundamental things, right? It's no longer considered just a side hustle because I feel in many ways, the term side hustle also kind of made it seem like it was a, um, a, a smaller part of a larger whole. So as I think it's become, the word is primary hustle in that sense. Um, it's also made it become serious business uh, to kind of build into. And so um, speaking of business, I want to actually get into saying that everyone looks at what you guys are doing, saying, okay, the, the way in which you would drive revenue would be bring people in, have them do courses, have them do um, degrees. But um, what are the other ways in which you're seeing revenue growth happening? What are the opportunities that you've seen in the space? Absolutely. So on NAS Academy's side, we've seen a lot of interest from brands, from companies, mm -hmm. from social media platforms, from governments even, who say, we can see that we want to do more content but we want to be able to do it in-house. You know, I think one of the things we discussed before this podcast was, 
over the last one year, there has been a huge surge in interest in influencer marketing. Mm. More and more companies are moving away from using paid Facebook ads, paid Google ads. Uh, particularly with Facebook, there've been some changes, which mean that it's much harder to yeah. track the performance of your ads. Yeah. And so what they've said is, if I go to individual content creators and influencers who have audiences that are specifically relevant to a topic, it could be personal finance, it could be travel, then my chances of acquiring customers are much higher. So with this space of all these people now using their marketing budgets on influencer marketing, yeah. it's become a lot more expensive. So now companies are saying to, to us, well, can we actually build our own influencers? Can we actually find people who love our product, who love our brand? Can we train them to create content and they can become our advocates? Yeah. So we've done that uh, with big brands uh, across the world. We also have worked with social media platforms like MX Tuck Attack, yeah. um, who partnered with us because they said, well, we want more people to create short form content. Yeah. And what's interesting for you know, your audience is there has been a big shift from long form, which yeah. was you know seven minute, ten minute videos on YouTube, it went you know you saw a big boom in Facebook, which was three minute videos, but now the one minute video is back, yeah. and we see YouTube Shorts, we see you know Instagram Reels, we see you know TikTok and other short form platforms, um, and so you know we've worked with MX Tech to help facilitate more people across India to be able to learn short form. And it's been amazing to see the different types of people. Yeah. We've had a police officer. We've had a, you know, a mother who wants to create content with her family. Yeah. Uh, there are so many different types of you know, individuals and all of them, no matter what their background, they find a way to use content. Um, yeah. to, so, so I think that in, in our case, you know, working with brands has been a really interesting and, and, and very, like we've loved the experience. I think for others, um, there are increasingly companies that are coming up around creators. So to give you some examples, a creator who has a business has the same needs as a business, mm -hmm. but they don't have the same tools. So a company that wants to do sales may have Salesforce, but for a creator, they don't have the same structure. So maybe they need that. Or what we've seen interestingly is people setting up insurance for creators, people setting up credit cards for creators, because actually interestingly, I've spoken to very, very big creators who can't get a credit card because yeah. they don't have a credit history. True. You know, so they can't, even though they're earning you know, revenue to be able to maybe even buy a house or, or others, they can't, they can't get a mortgage. So uh, these are all the problems that, or opportunities that those people can get into in the creator economy. So yeah. for those listening, I think it's, it's useful to, to put yourself in the shoes of a mm -hmm. creator and think about what are the problems I experience in everyday life in yeah. building a business. And those I think are the opportunities where people can actually build businesses around. Um, I think also just picking up one part of what you said, right? Is even when you're working with brands, are you seeing more and more brands kind of turning around saying, um, our teams need a lot more training and the whatever they might have learned traditionally from you know the university, MBAs, all that stuff, um, doesn't prepare them for this new world that we're in. Um, are you seeing that growing more and, and, and what kind of skill sets uh, beyond the creation aspect or like building their own influences that you're seeing brands really wanting their teams to know about? Absolutely. So what I think is interesting, and this is, we do a lot of education with brands, is I think in, in the past, brands have wanted to make high quality production videos. Mm. And in order to do that, it's hard to build, to train your team yeah. to, to yeah. be able to do that. But what's happened with the internet and with, with different content platforms is that actually the videos that perform the best are not necessarily the highly produced videos. Mm. Some of the videos that get hundreds of millions of views are an individual who holds up their phone yeah. and talks to it without any fancy production or animations. And so when, when brands un, you know, understand that, then they say, well, actually that is trainable within our marketing team or within actually we've had companies who come to us and say every single employee in our company is a content creator or should be because mm -hmm. they can be an advocate for the brand they can do employee engagement they can tell others about our products um, or in the case of real estate or insurance every real estate agent can use content to sell homes yeah. right or, or sell insurance plans so that's like examples how every individual can use content but if, for example, someone wanted to come into a company 
to be involved in the content creation process. It isn't just about videos. And yeah. you, you raised the point. It's a really good point. Um, for example, if you want to make a successful piece of content, you need to research and understand what you're going to write about. Yeah. You need to write the scripts. You need to actually shoot. You need to edit. And then another part that people really underappreciate is you need to understand the algorithms. Yeah. You need to understand that. That's, every that seems to be platform. the biggest part right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's relevant for all different platforms. Every platform is different. The algorithms change a lot. But actually, when we make content as Nas Daily, hmm. we actually make, we take one idea and we make 12 pieces of content. Yeah. And each content is slightly different, but it's based on the same idea. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to give you examples, it could be issues of formatting. It could be issues of music. You know, for example, we've been doing a lot on uh, Instagram Reels and, you know, with Instagram Reels and, and similarly with TikTok, you don't need to have a large subscriber or follower base because the algorithm allows you to be discovered within, you know, someone's homepage yeah. versus Facebook, which is very much about shareability. So when my friends share, that's how I get virality. And, you know, YouTube is different as well with subscribers and such. Yeah. So just being an expert at that or going deep into that without having any skills in anything else is extremely valuable yeah. for brands. And so I think that's how one can break it down and, and think about opportunities for themselves as well. Um, what are you seeing as, um, as broader trends in the space that, um, you know, apart from everything that we've spoken about, which you think that on, on two ends, one from a career aspect for people looking to work in, um, in obviously the broader creator economy and also in like in, in education in the space, but um, also from like someone who wants to work in the space, who wants to learn about it. And, and, and I think I'm just going broad on this one. So what are you mm. seeing as trends in the space? What trends I'm seeing in the space, there are a couple of that I would like to highlight. I think the first one is that content, while content is global as a platform, you know, mm -hmm. social media platforms are global, content is local. And what I mean by that is, if you actually look at viewer trends, if you actually look at what people consume, it isn't just what comes out of America, you mm. know, which was like the old school model of Hollywood and the traditional media. Mm. Um, in every country, in every language, there are big content powerhouses. There are big creators. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in the case of India, there are even, you know, with different languages, dialects, regions, et cetera, there are those micro ecosystems as well. Exactly. And so within that, um, when you think about uh, the wider trends, it, I, the way I interpret that is that something being built in the US doesn't mean that you can't build it locally. Mm. So if I give an example, Patreon. Mm. Patreon, which is a subscription platform that creators can use to get subs paid subscribers. Well, if I'm in a country that doesn't have credit cards yeah. or doesn't have high, high credit card penetration, Patreon is not very helpful for me. So a Patreon built with local payments in mm. Indonesia is, you know, it's an open space that someone yeah. can, can innovate for. Yeah. And I think that's the same with multiple ideas within the creator economy. Um, so I think that, you know, when someone, when, when your audience thinks about getting involved in a macro trend for the creator economy, I would advise them to look at what are trends happening in different big markets, China, the US, India, but mm -hmm. don't think just because there are big players already in that space that you can't innovate in a local way. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one trend. The second trend I think uh, I mentioned before about the trend towards the move towards short form content. Mm. I really see that social media platforms, you know, you look at people like Google mm. um, for them, this is something that they've had to react to yeah. because there are two problems with short form content. The first is that if people move towards short form, then platforms that have um, that have long form content will lose watch time and they yeah. will lose ads revenue. Yeah. But the second problem, which is an interesting problem for Google, is that Google indexes the world's information, mm. which is all written. Yeah. But if actually there's a move away from written towards more video, it's hard to index that information. Yeah. So that is why we're seeing, you know, YouTube shorts, we're seeing other platforms doing short form. So another trend I think is really important is don't just look at what's happened in the past when it comes to content. Content yeah. is changing very quickly. I think if you're looking to get into content or the creator economy, I would focus on what's happening in short form, yeah. whether you're creating content or whether you're building around it. Um, yeah. 
And when you think about short form, you know, some of the things I've, interesting things I've seen people build for is, for example, I'm sharing content within WhatsApp, as an example. Hmm. Uh, I can't track the performance of videos if people share yeah. it. So other ways to track, you know, shareability and virality and, and views. Um, the final trend that I'm seeing is how to connect businesses with distribution. Hmm. So there's an interesting company that um, I've seen in Southeast Asia that is helping um, restaurants link with content creators who could be the face of the brand. Yeah. So they can say, I have this new idea for a meal, for a burger, but I don't have the front. So let me find someone who can be the brand for it. So that's an interesting trend, which is taking traditional businesses and linking them to have creators be the front of that brand and help them with the marketing and the distribution. Like the Mr. Beast burger and stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. So for the Mr. Beast burger, for everyone who's listening, Mr. Beast is not actually making the burgers, right? Yeah. It's a partnership where he's working with experts in food and he's obviously thinking about the, the branding and then he's using his followers and his audience yeah. to, 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 find, to attract users to try the product. That trend does not have to be just relevant to Mr. Beast with you know, 70 million followers. Yeah. That process can happen on, on a smaller scale as well. Um, you know, towards the later part of every episode, I ask my guests a set of questions which have nothing to do with what we've spoken about so far. Um, these are generally random. They're supposed to be They've actually never been. They've actually been the same set of questions for a, for many episodes, but they're they're always random for the guests to answer. So, um, apart from you know NAS Academy and and ev- and everything that I do at work, um, what do you spend a lot of time doing outside of work that that you you're super interested in and then takes a lot of your time? I I did not expect these questions, but happy to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I am. So I'm originally from the UK. Mm. I'm a big, big football fan. Um, awesome. My team is Manchester United. I used mm. to live in Manchester, so I used to go to every game. Mm. Um, unfortunately, it's been a tough few years for us, mm. um, but I do still spend a lot of my time following them, following the team. In terms of my passions, I'm also, I've always been a keen like, history fan. Mm. So I've loved reading, um, you know, 20th century history and, and, and understanding past trends, but also when it comes to technology, I, I have been fascinated by, you know, some of the early, you know, early trends in the internet. Mm. Um, as a student at college, I wrote my thesis on the kind of introduction of web 2.0, yeah. which became really interesting about reflecting on, you know, with the talk of web three, I've been sort of reflecting on what did I see at the time? What actually happened? A little bit of tinge of regret as to why I didn't get involved earlier. <laughs> But, you know, to try and see like how it evolved and are there any learnings for the future? So I'm passionate about looking at the past to try and understand and, and trying to uh, predict trends in the future. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I, uh, I have a 14 month old daughter and I'm married and I love to spend my, my weekends in Singapore um, doing a lot of outdoors and nature yeah. And, and just, yeah, exploring the city. Always nice to meet, uh, nice to meet uh, dads of daughters. I think we, we, we're a global club in that sense of the word. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you you mentioned um, I'd like to read a lot of stuff around um, around space. So, which is actually my next question: like anything that you've read, listened to, or watched that you'd recommend recent times? Yeah, I I, I mean I love a mixture of both um, you know stories of startup startup founders and journeys. Plus, I love read like reading a lot about just general history. Yeah. Um, I think that you know for us, we've been delving a lot into. Uh, the crypto space. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, one of the most interesting things I've listened to recently, it's, it's a very well-known podcast, but um, How I Built This mm-hmm. uh, has a story of the founder of Coinbase. Yeah. And yeah. I would highly recommend uh, people to listen to that if they haven't already. And I, I'll tell you a few reasons why. I think the first thing that he said was he joined Airbnb as a product manager, I think in 2012. And what he said was he thought at that point that he'd missed the boat on all the big opportunities in the, uh, on the internet. He said, all the big companies in the internet have already been built. Yeah. And, you know, little did he know. And obviously, yeah. you know, what's happened. And I found that really inspiring that, you know, no matter what is being built, there is just still, even just with the internet alone, without any mm-hmm. other like developments, um, there is still so much to be built. Yeah. And so I think, you know, people listening who are starting their career, they should be inspired by that. Um, the second thing is, and I see this as someone who's in a startup, you know, we're a series A startup. 
When people tell the story in hindsight of their startup, they often yeah. tell the story about everything being rosy and every time you grew and it was just a perfect story. The reality is this is never true. <laughs> so true. It's never true. So if, if you're starting your journey on, in a startup or in a company and it's not like that, I just want to reiterate that you are not alone. Mm -hmm. It is the norm. Mm -hmm. And so I think what was great about this podcast was that he explains how many times they almost as a company did not survive how many times that to change track. And it, it, it really teaches you a lot about when you go through that, it's normal. And a lot of what he learned was that you just don't, you just must not quit. Yeah. You know, and I think that was just for me, very, very inspiring. And, and we took that actually and presented the whole company uh, as a lesson of how nice. even in those hard times, you know, you have to just have that resolve. If you really believe in what you're doing, uh, that you keep going. And I think in our, even our short history, we've seen the benefits of that. Oh, that's awesome. That actually that, that episode's been on my to listen to list. And I think I'm going to definitely get into that one. Um, hopefully over the next one, two days. Um, what can you put together in an instant? I am not a bad cook. <laughs> so I um I find it very kind of relaxing when I have a long day. Um I have to say I do not cook British food. I would <laughs> highly recommend not eating British food. I don't really personally think it's very good. Um, what I actually enjoy... hear, too, I hear many people say that my sister lives in London and she says that too uh, often. Yeah. Enough. I think that London is a great um, sort of a multicultural city. And yeah. so it has food from all over the world. But uh, yes, when I lived in London, I did not eat uh, traditional <laughs> British food. Um, so yeah, I love cooking uh, a lot of Thai food, uh, Vietnamese food, you know, living in Southeast Asia, I've been very spoiled um, to have such great food there. Uh, other things like from a work perspective, um, I realized early on in my career that I love bringing people together and kind of making individuals like bigger than the sum of their parts. So I really enjoy at work. Um, one of the biggest satisfactions I get is developing people mm -hmm. and, and helping them work. So I think what can I do in an instant is often bring people from different teams and different yeah. skills together yeah. to work on something exciting. And yeah. I think that's why that was, that's what keeps me motivated. And uh, my, my final question, which is generally a spin on the name of the show itself, um, is uh, why do you think creators as educators will not die? Great question. I think that the internet will continue to bring opportunities to monetize and build a career online. Ultimately, what a creator is doing is creating things and finding ways to, um, you know, finding opportunity to do different things. And as long as that exists, there's gonna be a need to learn how to do that. And ultimately what I believe is the people who are best at teaching are those who do. So as long as the internet exists and there are ways to create things and monetize things, then I think education from creators is here to stay. Thank you so much, Alex. Thanks for coming on the show. It's been a fabulous chat. I have tons of insights on this one. Um, thank you so much for coming on Advertising is Dead. Thank you so much for having me. Really enjoyed it. I V M.